Judge Martin, bonsoir. So you're 64 now. Oh. <laughs> Do you still receive a Valentine for birthday <laughs> from the boys? I, I do actually. Yeah, you do. I had a very nice message from Paul. Yeah. When I was 64. Yeah. A bottle of wine and a birthday greeting. Yeah, I was obliged to tell you that, you know. <laughs> uh, you are famous, worldwide famous and forever as the Beatles producer. But very few people know that uh, in 69 you started a studio in London called Air Studio, and ten years later, another studio in Montserrat, in the Caribbean, called uh, Air Studio Montserrat. Beautiful island, yeah. quite small, very near one of your islands, very near to Guadeloupe. Mm -hmm. um, it is very mountainous and has a lot of rain, but mainly at night. In September, on the 17th of September, uh, 89, there was a hurricane uh, in the Caribbean, and uh, 12,000 people lost everything That's in right. the island, no? It was complete devastation. Yeah. I went there as soon as I could. Yeah. Because for the first week, we could not even speak to anyone there. Yeah. Uh, because the hurricane made everyone homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, the harbor was destroyed. Mm -hmm. The hospital had lo lost half of its mm -hmm. wards. Um, and even the generating, all the power went to the whole island. Mm -hmm. No electricity. We didn't have electricity for two months. Uh, everything was destroyed. And your studio has been out of order too, no? Our studio has not been operating since then, mm -hmm. because although the studio itself um, was well built, yeah. um, nevertheless we had no power, no mm -hmm. air conditioning, mm -hmm. and the island is not in, wasn't in any state to mm -hmm. have famous stars there, yeah. you know. If uh, Mick Jagger goes there, yeah. he wants a little bit of comfort, yeah. and there's no comfort there right now. So you decided to raise money, and you decided to, to sell a record, an album, yeah. and you asked uh, numbers to different stars, Paul McCartney, of course, uh, Simply Red, uh, Mid -Jour. The Rolling Stone gave you something special, no? Well, they gave me one of the tracks they hadn't actually issued on their mm -hmm, album, mm -hmm. which uh, was very nice of them, because they made their album last year, yeah. not very long before the hurricane, mm -hmm. in Montserrat. Mm -hmm. And when I heard of the disaster, I said, well, I'm sure everyone wants to help the people of the island mm -hmm. who've lost everything. Um, and I contacted every artist, and everyone said, of course we'll, mm -hmm. we'll give a track. Mm -hmm. So on the record is one track that every artist made while yeah. on the island. Yeah, Dire Straits, Need You, Boy George, Duran Duran, Status Quo. <laughs> so, let, let's talk about your life now. What have you been doing before you, you met the Beatles or the Beatles met you? Well, I had been a record producer for 12 years already, mm -hmm. but I, I was uh, running the Parlophone label yeah. in England. Yeah. And it was a small label, so yeah. I did everything. And I it was a branch of EMI. A branch of EMI, but yeah. it was uh, a very small English label. Mm -hmm. And I had to record everything from jazz, classical music, mm -hmm. uh, popular music, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided to specialize in comedy records. Mm -hmm. right. And I uh, made a, in fact, to begin with, I was known mm -hmm. as a comedy producer. Mm -hmm. That's why you recorded Peter Sellars or Peter yes, Justina. That's right. Yeah. Peter Yosnop yeah. and uh, Flanders and Swan and mm -hmm. uh, Dudley Moore mm -hmm. and Peter Cook. Mm -hmm. um, and I made a reputation for that. And in fact, when the Beatles came along, yeah. that was one of the reasons why we got on so well together. Mm -hmm. Because to them, I was famous because I made all those records that they liked so much. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they thought they, they will have fun with you, maybe, no? Well, and they, they also had the same kind of humor. Mm -hmm. they, were, they had that weird um, zany type of humor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know how you, you, you got in touch with them the first time. It's by a, you, you received a phone call from a guy called Sid Coleman about a, another guy called Brian Epstein, and you decided to meet them. What happened? Well, Brian had been to every record company in the country, yeah. and I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I had known it, I'm not sure I would have taken it. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't know it. They have been refused by Deca, Pi, Philips, everybody. Everybody, yeah. even, even EMI. Yeah, they, I they've even been to EMI. EMI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two of the people in EMI had turned them down. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, apparently, he went along to the shop in Oxford Street to have some records cut mm -hmm. from tapes that he had, mm -hmm. so he could still try and get some action. Mm -hmm. And the man who listened to the record said, why don't you take them to Sid Coleman, who's a music publisher mm -hmm. for Yemma. Mm -hmm. And so he went to see Sid Coleman, and Sid Coleman said, who have you shown these to? Mm -hmm. Brian recited all the people. He said, well, it's pretty well everyone. He said, have you tried George Martin? He said, no, who's George Martin? He said, well, he's a guy who has a reputation for doing some unusual thing mm -hmm. and uh, on Parlophone. Mm -hmm. And I was the kind of joker of the pack of cards, mm -hmm. do you understand? Mm -hmm. I was the bottom of the pack. <laughs> <laughs> and he came to see me and yeah. um, I listened to what he had. What did you think really the first time you heard his uh, record? I, well, they were very bad records. Yeah. So I felt sorry for the people later who mm -hmm. had turned them down. Mm -hmm. But there was something there that I thought was interesting. And I was looking for something anyway. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I can't judge on this. I'll have to see them and I'll have to work with them mm -hmm. before I can make up my mind. Mm -hmm. And you, you asked uh, him to make them come from uh, Hamburg, where they were playing in the Star Club, famous Star Club, to you, yeah. just to have an audition in, uh, in Abbey Road. We came to Abbey Road yeah. and uh, I spent an evening with them. Yeah. And I fell in love with them. Yeah, love at first sight, you say. Love at first sight. Yeah. And uh, what did they play for you the first time? Uh, well, some very boring songs, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, think, well, they played Love Me Do. Le 12 septembre 62, les Beatles s'étaient retrouvés dans le studio numéro 2 d'Abbey Road pour enregistrer Love Me Do. Il avait fallu 17 prises pour faire le disque où Andy White remplace Ringo Starr qui ne joue que du tambourin et des maracas sur la face B, P.S. I love you. Yeah. I also played things like Over the Rainbow. Yeah. Besame Mucho. Besame yeah. Mucho was one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sort of, they, they didn't show at that time that they could be great composers. Mm -hmm. Nothing they had written yeah. was very good. Love yeah. Me Do was about the best they had. Mm -hmm. They did have a version of Please Please Me, but it was very slow. Mm -hmm. Like Roy Orbison, very, mm -hmm. very slow. Mm -hmm. And um, so Love Me Do I picked as the first one. You say that George was the most talkative. After the first recording, yeah. I thought, well, maybe I'm not getting that sound the way they think it should be. Mm -hmm. So I brought them into the control room. I said, look, have a listen to this. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything you don't like, let me know. Yeah. And George, George turned to me and said, well, for a start, I don't like your time. <laughs> Pete Best, you, you thought he wasn't a good, dr good drummer. Uh, you, you wanted to, re to have another one, and you thought of a pro, a guy called Andy White. Right. And they presented you, they introduced you to uh, Ringo Starr. And why did you choose Starr at the end instead of uh, your guy Andy White? Well, I didn't. Uh, the thing was that I'd, uh, I didn't want to jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Do you understand? Yeah. And I knew that I had to get a better drummer than Pete. So Andy White was a regular, he was a top session musician. Mm -hmm. When Ringo came along, I didn't know him at all. Mm -hmm. And so I said to the boys, look, he, he may be good, but as far as I'm concerned, I've got this fellow we're paying money for. Let's yeah. use him. But then when Ringo started to play, um, he had a distinctive sound, and, um, and he fitted in very well. But he never forgave me for not letting him play on the first <laughs> session. He still holds it up against me. Yeah. The problem was to know who will be the leader of the group, because uh, you didn't know among them who will be the leader, and you decided to to see them play in, in the cavern in Liverpool. Yes, sure. I saw all they did in the cavern. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget, at that time, the groups that existed were focused around one person, mm -hmm. like Cliff Richard and the yeah. Shadows. Yeah. And it was unusual to have a group that was democratic, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, but then when I was in, li in with Liverpool, I realized that the group shouldn't be changed. It was, they were dead right as they were. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it was obvious that whoever wrote the song would sing it. Écrite par Lennon et McCartney dans une camionnette lors d'une tournée du côté de Newcastle, She Loves You sera la première des Beatles à passer à la télé américaine et restera d'août à novembre 63, 12 semaines en tête du 8 anglais, version parodique par Peter Sellers et George Martin. So they, they proposed you songs, and uh, every time you said, I want more, I want more, and uh, they, they came with uh, From Me To You, with uh, She Loves You, and you said they were a bottomless uh, well of songs. You discovered they were really great songwriters, no? Very well, quickly. It, no? Success, actually. Yeah, yeah. Success helped them. Yeah. It made them realize that they must work harder. Yeah. And it was just like putting a little plant in a greenhouse and yeah. turning on sunlight. Yeah. They suddenly blossomed and they were marvelous that, that first year fantastic you came to paris with them for the olympia yeah. because they were to record songs in, in german no i want to hold your hand and she loves you in german That's right. because Ima in germany wanted them to sing in, in german and when you were in paris you you learned that the record was number one in the states and uh, you came to the george uh, five and there was a party was well it was a very exciting time yeah. First of all, the Beatles didn't want to record in yeah. a foreign language anywhere. Yeah. And they thought it was silly. Yeah. And they were quite right, yeah. in fact. But the Germans insisted we did this. And to begin with, they didn't want to do it. They were appearing at Olympia in mm -hmm. Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the time came for them to appear, on, uh, for, to do this recording, mm -hmm. they didn't turn up. And I was at the studios waiting for them. And I kept looking at what? What's happened? You know, they didn't turn up. I rang the George Sank. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Neil Aspinall, who was their road, road manager. Man, road yeah. manager. And he said, "Well, I'm sorry, George, but they'd said they're not coming." I said, "You get tell them I want them right here, right now, and I'm not having any nonsense." And he said, "Well, you'll have to tell them yourself." So I, I got in a cab and I went back to the George Sank. Mm -hmm. I went up to their apartment. I burst in. I said, "What the hell?" You know, sort of shouting at them. And they were all having tea mm -hmm. around a table mm -hmm. with Jane Asher, mm -hmm. Paul's girlfriend. She was there pouring tea. And it was just like a scene out of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as I entered the door, they all ran to all different corners of the room yeah. and put cushions over their heads <laughs> and hid, you know, and pretended they were scared. And you couldn't be angry with them for yeah. long. Mm -hmm. You know, they were so charming. Yeah. And they came to the studios and we did the job. Yeah. But they were quite right. We shouldn't have done it in general. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand. And I say that something. Composé à la fin de l'été 63 dans la cave de la maison de Jane Asher à la suite d'un accord plaqué au hasard par Paul, I want to hold your hand, détrône dès sa sortie en Angleterre, She Loves You, de la place de numéro 1, mais ce sera surtout la première à être la première aux USA. You were very involved and essential in the transition from rock and roll to pop music, to progressive pop music. And uh, you made them discover new instruments for them, like classical instruments, for instance, and we can hear it on Eleanor Rigby. Because when you were recording classical music, you were specialized in Baroque, no? They had eternal curiosity. Yeah. They always wanted to find out more. Mm -hmm. And they were always saying to me, 
give me new sounds. Mm. What do you have? Mm. What is a classical orchestra? Yeah. And I would give them, give them what I knew. Yeah. And when it came to Penny Lane, uh, Paul had heard a Bach Brandenburg concerto. Mm -hmm. And he came to me the following day and said, I heard a, a fantastic sound last night. It was a, a Bach piece. I said, it was very high trumpet. I said, well, yes, you can get those. He said, could we use it? <laughs> so sure we can. Yeah. So that was how we got Penny Lane. Écrite avec un little help from John pour les paroles, Penny Lane, en phase B si l'on peut dire, 100% pure Lennon, ce sera Strawberry Fields Forever, toutes deux prévues pour être sur Sir John Pepper, sortant single en février 67, au piano, George Martin. Penny Lane. introduced them to new techniques of recording, like uh, uh, reverse tape, and tomorrow never, never knows, no? Mm -hmm. Well, I was always experimenting in those days, because we didn't have synthesizers. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're a product of today. And if we had to make weird sounds, we had to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do it was just playing around, mm -hmm. like so many people have done since, in, mm -hmm. on their own recorders. And I would do all sorts of cutting up of tapes and putting them back together yeah. again. And John told you uh, every time, uh, take care of it. Because, uh, I don't know, it's for Strawberry Fields Forever. Uh, he wanted to keep the first part of one song and the second part of the, another take, let's say. That's right. And uh, he said, take care of it. And you, you managed it, no? Well, the trouble with the two bits that he wanted to fit together was mm. that they were in different keys yeah. and in different pitches. Yeah. But by sliding the speeds around, yeah. I was able to bring them together. <laughs> Take you down Cause I'm going to Strawberry Fin de la deuxième prise accélérée de 5% et collée à la première moitié de la première, Strawberry Fields Forever. Comme Penny Lane, l'endroit existe vraiment à Liverpool. It was the time when four tracks were happening too, no? Yeah. And you made the Sgt. Pepper with only four tracks. That's right. How did you manage to do it? Uh, I couldn't have done it any other way because <laughs> that's all there was. Yeah. You know, if I'd had 16 tracks mm -hmm. or 24 or mm -hmm. 48 tracks, mm -hmm. I would have used them. Mm -hmm. But I only had four tracks. Mm -hmm. So that's how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> And you helped them a lot because they came to you with embryos of songs or raw material and you helped them to make uh, definitive songs too, yeah. no? Well, that was part of the process. It's part of, part of the process today of being a good producer. Yeah. To be someone that the artist can trust that will give an opinion that is true. Mm -hmm. Because if you are very famous and you are a big songwriter and you show work to somebody, and you're very famous, they'll say, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. People are scared to yeah, say, yeah. I think it can be better. Mm -hmm. And that's what a producer must do. Mm -hmm. So you, had the, you, you played yourself some instruments? Yeah, I played the keyboard. A keyboard? I used to play the oboe many years ago. How were you paid? Did you get fees or, or royalties? How were you paid on those records? <laughs> Badly. Badly? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to begin with, I was 
a staff member yeah. of EMI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all I got was £3,200 a year. Not very much. No car. No royalties. No, no commission. Mm -hmm. Which is really why I left. I left in 65 and started my own company. And then I got royalties. Oh. And you had problems later when you recorded uh, McCartney no? with EMI, you know? In what way? In a way that uh, they said on your contract oh. you have to record oh. the Beatles. You're right. And you said they split, but they said no, it's, a, it's, it's Paul right. McCartney. That's right. Because when we negotiated a deal for Beatles royalties, mm -hmm. it was a very small amount. It was 20% of one penny yeah. only. Yeah. Very small amount. Yeah. And when I came to record McCartney, they said, you said you would record, you'd guarantee to record the Beatles. Yeah. And this is the same rate. But, uh, I argued with it. Yeah, we terrible. Got <laughs> how, how did you live through their split? Uh, it was a difficult time, and because they were unhappy with each other, mm -hmm. and uh, it was the worst time of all was let it be, because I really thought that was the end of the road, mm -hmm. because they were quarrelling all the time, and um, the women didn't help, mm -hmm. and. I was quite surprised after Let It Be when Paul rang me up and said, we'd like to make another record with you, mm -hmm. which was Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'll only do it if we do it like we did it before, mm -hmm. with proper producing. And he said, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. So we did finish on Abbey Road, mm -hmm. and it was very happy. We all got on well together. Side two is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, side two of Abbey Road was what I'd always wanted to do after Pepper, mm -hmm. to make a kind of symphonic feel mm -hmm. to yeah. something. And uh, John didn't want to do that. John wanted a rock and roll record. Mm -hmm. So when we did Abbey Road, it was a compromise. Mm -hmm. One side was what I wanted to do with Paul. John minded and the other one was more you and Paul minded. Des revolvers, on savait que George Harrison était un grand songwriter. Le double blanc l'avait confirmé. Sur Abbey Road, il signe Something sur la face A. Et Here Come the Sun sur la face B. A la fin de Something, les nonnes au piano enchaînent sur l'intro de Remember, qu'il sortira un an plus tard avec Plastique Ono Band. Did you did you learn the death of John? Uh, Where I, were you? I was at home, and it was early in the morning, mm -hmm. six o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and I was due to go to the studio because I was working with Paul McCartney mm -hmm. on Tug of War, mm -hmm. and I heard the news, and I immediately rang Paul at his home, mm -hmm. and I said, I don't suppose you want to come in today, do you? He'd rather not work today. He said, oh, I can't stay here. I've got to come in. I've got to talk. So we agreed to meet in the studio, and we didn't do any work. We just talked all day about John. And we just sort of worked it out of our system. It was a terrible shock, and it helped being able to talk to each other about mm -hmm. the good times. And it was awful, really. The only if I can reproach you something, why did you accept to direct the musical score of the Sgt. Pepper yeah. film produced by Robert Stigwood with uh, the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton? Good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, it had all the credentials for being good yeah. because it was a stage play in, uh, on Broadway which was staged extremely well and an old friend of mine called Jim Dale, mm -hmm. who is a Broadway star now, uh, saw it and said, it's fantastic. And if they make a film of this, it'd be marvelous. Uh, but what I didn't realize, what, once I'd signed the contract to do it, I was involved. And I didn't realize that all the songs that are, were so dear to me were going to be recorded and I had to record them with people I didn't know. Yeah. Um, 
you know, that was upsetting. Mm. But there we are, that's life. You make some good decisions, you make some bad ones. And do you still meet uh, George and uh, Ringo? No? Sometimes. Um, I haven't seen Ringo since he had his little spell in, yeah. in uh, America. And I've seen George recently. Yeah. Um, they get on fine, we still talk occasionally. Mm -hmm. But I see Paul most of all. What did the Beatles add that others didn't in your eye? It was the song. Mm -hmm. It was the songs were brilliant songs, mm -hmm. and they had a, a well of creativity that I hadn't experienced in anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, they were fantastic. And what would have been the Beatles without George Martin? Oh, the Beatles would have been the Beatles, I'm sure. I'm sure someone would have taken mm -hmm. them and made... It may not have been the same, but it would have been... They still, they were too good not to, not to happen. And what would have been George Martin without the Beatles? Probably still making comedy records. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Get busy.